Sarah Brickcliffe, the youngest ever Conservative MP elected in uh, 2019, when you were 24. I'm going to start by taking you back to something terrible that I read that happened to you. You lost your mum, Gabrielle, when you were nine years old in 2004. What happened? Um, my mum was alcoholic. Oh, God. Um, she, she was the best woman that you could ever meet. Best woman you could ever meet. And she loved me so much and everybody knew it. Anybody who knew my mum knew how attached she was to me. She wouldn't leave my side. And that was one of the problems because it was mum and daughter. My brothers have uh, a different mum to me. And she struggled throughout my life, um, but she was very good at hiding it from my dad. So what she used to do, was she used to take me up to bed and she'd then go and drink a bottle of vodka whilst I was tucked upstairs in bed. And so my family didn't realize that, well, what was happening really with her. Um, and I think it was when my grandma was still alive, she'd fallen down the stairs or something like Your that. Your mum has. Yeah, and that's when my grandma realised that she, she was potentially an alcoholic. But we also had the problem where her family in Germany didn't believe it either. Um, so it, it got to the position where we found myself in some really difficult situations with my mum where I think my dad went abroad with the boys um, and my mum was looking after me. And again, nobody realised that she was an alcoholic and she ended up locking me in the house um, and she went and she, she'd gone and had a drink and the fire brigade had to come and get me out. Um, How old were you? Probably four or five years old at that point. Um, so that's when people realised that there was a problem, a huge problem. And I absolutely despised my dad throughout this and it, it wasn't his fault, but it felt like he was taking me away uh, from my mum because social services got involved and said, if Gabby doesn't move out of the family home, we're taking Sarah into care. Um, Sarah, this is... Yeah, so, it sh but honestly, I, I remember everything about my mum and she just loved me. And anybody that you met would tell you she adored me. And that was one of the problems because everybody would always say to me, as a young girl at the age of four, five, six years old, that the only way that she would stop drinking is because of me. And that pressure that existed as a little girl that the only way that your mum would survive was for you to do something about it, that you could fix it. It wasn't the case. And that's why I think a lot of support is needed for families of alcoholics. Um, because there was a time when I remember, it was all over the papers because my dad at the time was the leader of the council. Yes. Um, and she'd left me in Manchester airport and she'd had a drink in the airport and we were going to Germany to see my family in Germany. And she got on the plane and was arrested on the plane for being drunk and disorderly. How old, how old, how old are you? Probably five, six years old at that point. So I remember, I don't, I don't remember everything about it because obviously I was quite young, but I remember being sat in the police station in Manchester airport, waiting for my dad to pick me up. Um, there was a time in Germany, and that this is probably one of the worst moments that I remember but we'd gone to Germany, it must have been prior because I was allowed to travel with her at that point. Um, and my grandma and granddad were quite ill. They were in the 90s, 80s, 90s. And we used to, because she just was so protective of me, we used to sleep in the same bed, we'd cuddle up at night. Um, and I remember her turning round to me in bed and saying, I'm going to die now, Sarah. But she, she turned around to me and she said, I'm going to die now, Sarah. And I was so young. Um, but I'd grown up a lot because I'd already experienced all of this with her. Um, and so I ran downstairs and I knew, I think it was my grandma was really ill at that point. So I ran down the first um, set of stairs, went down into the living room and I picked up the phone to ring my auntie in Germany. I said, mummy's telling me she's going to die. And my auntie just, she wasn't listening. I, I remember her just not taking it in. I said, mummy is telling me she's going to die. And so my auntie came put me in bed with my grandma and my mum was fine the next day. And that was just her having too much to drink. There were times where I used to go into the house and when you're a kid, you, you see all of these TV programs as, as to how you look after someone when they're not feeling well. And I remember seeing something of 
of when somebody can't breathe, they breathe into a bag. That's all I could remember. And I remember my mum saying to me, I can't breathe, I just can't breathe. So I'd go and get a plastic bag and put it on her mouth because I didn't want anybody coming into the house and taking her away from me again and taking her into rehab. Um, so there was, a, there was a constant battle between my dad having to do what he had to do to protect me, but obviously his little girl despising him because she wanted to be with mum. If you were making changes now, that would have helped you as the child of an alcoholic and there are campaigns on this. Yes. There are people on both sides of the House of Commons who have grown up in the situation which you describe. I don't think I've heard it described as, as powerfully as this, I would say. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that could have made your childhood better? It's, it's, yes, it's a support around a person coming out of rehab because what happened was my mum moved into a, a, a council house um, she'd be cared for 24-7 in Harvey House in Lancaster. But then what happens is she goes home and then once I've left the house, who's there? Who's there to give her the support that she needed and, and the advice? So what she did instantly was she'd, she'd go and get a bottle of vodka. So she'd last for about six weeks and my dad would be like, this is brilliant, you can look after Sarah. And I remember him doing that once and she'd, I'd walked, it was only across the road from my dad's house. Literally, you could run through the graveyard, climb over my mum's back wall, and I'd be in the house. Um, and he said, right, well, I'm having a night out with friends tonight. Gabby can look after Sarah. So I was so excited. My mum was looking after me for the first time. She was coming to my dad's house to do it. And I remember turning up at the house, and she'd obviously drank a, a lot. And I didn't want to tell my dad that. Um, so I walked her round to my dad's house where she fell over a wall and split her head off. This was all before the age of nine years old. Um, and I didn't want to tell my dad because I wanted her to be able to look after me again. Um, so she, I sat in my dad's house with a piece of tissue on her head where she'd been bleeding until my dad got home because I just didn't want anybody to take that opportunity away from me. So the support for people when they come out of rehab, that they're not just sat on their own in, in the home, I think is key. But also, it's not just about the children who need the support, it's more awareness that actually, for example, people telling me that I could fix my mum being an alcoholic, people understanding that being an alcoholic is an illness, it's, it's, it's still so, so stigmatised. I mean, we hear it all the time about, oh, it's drunk, things like that. It's an illness, and without the right support, you end up in a catastrophic situation like my mum did. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm actually pretty lost for words. What are the implications as you grow up, as you become a, 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 an adult? An adult. Um, so I struggled throughout my teenage life with this because it's mum and daughter, isn't it? It's like a dad and a son. And so you miss out on the opportunity. When your friends used to go, oh, my mum's taking me shopping this week. Everything like that, you just miss out on. Now, I had some motherly figures in my life, which I was very lucky to have, but it didn't fully hit me until I went to university. And that was moving out of the family home, moving away from my brothers and my dad. And I started to really, really struggle with my mental health. Um, and my doctor prescribed me with paroxetine. And it was 20 milligrams, really, really quite a high strength. And so I was on that for the first year of university. And I actually ended up failing my first year of university because I struggled to leave the house. And I think that was just because the first, it was the first time I'd been away from the support that I'd had. And the first time it really hit me about being alone and having to deal with the thoughts of, of what I've been dealing with since I was nine years old. So I, I had just four or five years where I really, really struggled with my mental health to the point of wanting to take my own life. How are you now? Because you've gone on to lead this remarkable life. I mean, it doesn't, I still struggle. Um, I mean, it's nearly 20 years now since I lost my mum. And the worst bit for me is I'm starting to forget a voice because I'm um, 
But actually, mentally, I'm in a really good position. But that's because I, I sought support. Okay, tell me about that spark. Yeah. So you got you, you you got some antidepressants. You went to see your doctor. Yeah. What else helped you? Um, well, I think being thrown in at the deep end with this job kind of made you too busy to even think about anything. So that, again, delayed the process of me suffering because I just was so focused on the job. And I absolutely love the job because you can make a difference. But then after the pandemic, things started to ease off. You had more time to think. I wasn't getting that work-life balance because you don't, you know, Gloria, it's so difficult to find the work-life balance in this job. And so I actually sought support through Parliament um, and it's massively helped. But I wouldn't say that I've ever been at the stage during my parliamentary career as to the stage that I was at university because somehow I'd, I'd fixed myself in a sense. That is the most remarkable interview. Yeah. How proud your mum would yeah. be and your dad must be of what you have achieved and what you've overcome and the bravery you have exhibited today will help others too. We've never met before. No. It's a pleasure to meet you. Sarah Brickliffe, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.